Welcome in to the Cam and Strick podcast, episode number 35. Cam, what's 35 in Spanish? Do you know? Fuck, I don't know. Why Why even start with a stupid-ass question like that? You already riled me up. Like, I'm already kind of riled up a little bit. Eddie was great. Okay, we're not talking about Eddie. Fuck, we're not talking Eddie about Belfort Eddie. Eddie is coming up in the podcast. Eddie Bar- soon, I mean, don't, we're not even editing this out. I don't even care. Eddie is coming up. But I was a little rattled. Why are you rattled? Because well, we need feedback on shit. Okay, we need feedback on stuff. So I learned one thing today. What you don't handle constructive criticism. No, no I fucking well. a, I do. No, 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 I do. When somebody's like Cam, stop cussing so much. People, I'm like, okay, damn, I gotta stop. You know, my mom used to tell me that back in the day. Although she let me do it when I was like nine years old. I used to, I think I started boozing when I was nine years old. So they have no say in anything. So I'm like, I don't, I don't give a shit. But when they say, I'm like, yeah, damn right, Cam. Hey, figure out your facts a little more when you interview people. Yeah, you're right on that. I fucked up the Eric Lindros one where I said I fucking. I played against him where I didn't. I fucked that up. I thought I don't that know. was funny. I thought it was, that was not funny. funny. It's stupid. It's funny, and the but but then when somebody critiques me, and I'm like, damn, I have to be that way to get my question across. I'm new to this. I didn't go to fucking Mizzou. You know, I went to your high school. I played hockey. Like I don't know shit. I got my own show every day, but I'm not used to answer, uh, asking questions. I, I, you're great at it, Andy. We all no, know I'm that. Not, man. So I, when we listen. get when I get cons- cr- uh, criticism, I'm like, damn. Okay, how do I fix that? But some things you just can't fix. So it just rattled me a little bit, Andy. That's all, yeah, baby. Yeah, that's okay, man. I want to fucking hit somebody. I love the fact that you're uh, being vulnerable. You know, you're opening yourself up. Dude, I take shit serious, man. This is our livelihood. So it's not like I'm fucking, well, I don't care. I got 40 in a bank. No, I got to work. So I got to make this work. So when you do hear criticism, you got to fix it. Mm-hmm. And some shit's harder to fix than others. If you don't want to cuss, I'm not going to do it. No, you can. Fook. Who said, I can say fook. But who said you can't cuss? I don't know. I, I think know. I think so. Some- no, no one did. No one did. No, I need to tone it down a little bit, and I do. I didn't even cuss against with Eddie or Pierre Maguire. I didn't even. Th- I, I think I cussed twice. I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. But nobody's telling you not to cuss. No, I know. I can't. I, I know how to do it on the radio, but a podcast is like, damn, can't that just be free? Dude, that's man. what a podcast is. Can't that just be free, Andy? Shit, just like we're fuck, we go anywhere. We're like, what's up, man? Hey, let me ask you questions about the everywhere we go. I'm we're, we're socializing. Hey. With everybody. That's how I talk to people. All I've ever done my entire career is traditional media. And sometimes it's nice just to sit back and have a casual, yeah, real man. conversation. Yeah. Which traditional media platforms, they don't give that give you that luxury. They don't give you that ability to do that. No, I know. So that's what a podcast is. See, podcast to me, I think everyone has like their different opinions of what a podcast is. To me, a podcast is just a raw Freelance, conversation, baby. man. It's no different than if you were sitting in somebody's house and having a personal conversation. That's how I am. There are no rules no. in a podcast. And people tune into a podcast, I would think, because they want to hear the real side and the raw side of an athlete, a, converse- a celebrity. Just like having a conversation. Just a real conversation, yes. man. And where it's just, it is what it is. We're not sitting there trying to, like, I'm not you know, catering to you. I'm just, no. I'm catering to people that just, th- th- here's how I look at it. When I go to a concert, when I go to the bar, when we go to events, Andy, that we go to, oh, Every gosh dang, every weekend. Now you're not cussing. I'm not doing it. <laughs> every gosh dang weekend, Andy, we go to, <laughs> how nerdy is that? Every fucking weekend, we go to an event, and we talk to people. Cam, what's this? What's that? And I'm like, hey, what, that, 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 that's how I'm hey. talking to you. This is how I'm talking to you, just like on a podcast. This We're real. We're chilling, I baby. said this the other Damn, day. Damn, man. Listen, and, and people, people don't sometimes understand oh, when things are changing right in front of their own eyes. You know, and I'm not one of these that feels like, you know, I got to drop F-bombs all the no, time. But it, but But it doesn't. Um, offend me doesn't you know I don't run away from that if I want to drop if I want to say fuck I'm going to say fuck okay like it doesn't really bother me if I want to say it Michael Jordan is saying fuck on ESPN okay See, that I, don't is like a, that. I don't like that, that I'd rather him say fook that is a game changer though I mean when you have the most polished cleanest athlete maybe ever okay all Come of on. a sudden dropping F-bombs on not ESPN, just him. Not just and him, not just everybody. him, but everybody. It's awesome. It's like they're real. I, I, I like I like Michael Jordan. Every Nobody single day better. should ever complain about hearing an f bomb from you and me, for God's sakes, on a podcast. On a podcast, I'm not doing it on 590. No, 590. we're dynamic, baby. <laughs> 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 no, it, it, look, it's not it's not the end all be all, but I do. I, I do take it serious, man. Like, I, I joke around a lot. Like, I joke. I'm a jokey guy. I'm always happy. Why am I always happy? I don't know, but I'm glad I am. I have a happy life. I have a happy life. But when I'm, but I'm emotional. He's got, he's got new hair. I'm just you know, I got fucking, he's I got, got paired to he's have got hair. hair pl- he's got hair plugs. I got my wife. My wife's a fucking trooper. 
She's a badass somebody, bitch. Some, I won't say who it was. Somebody who critiqued what? that video. They said that the well, camera. How can you they, not? They said the camera was too low. How can you not? <laughs> but I put my wife on there because she's gorgeous. Why do you put her on there? Because that's what the people want to see. Oh, they want. That was their idea, <laughs> no, not yours. It, no, that it had it, to be yours. I, no, they. they uh, it makes it, you feel better. If I look, if I'm going to talk about my hair loss, I want Kate next to me. <laughs> you know, I like Kate. Kate, help me with this. She's a trooper, man. Hey, let's like, talk about it. it. When what? did you start losing your hair? Oh my God! And what was your reaction? Oh. How did you handle that? Oh. Can I tell you this? I've got. I'll a, tell you right I, now. Let me I don't say this. Shit. My best friend. Yep. Um, cool ass dude. Okay. What's her name? His name. His name's Scott. This dude, and he's listened to like one or two of these. Hopefully, he doesn't he listen to this. He complain about me? No, he oh, wouldn't. He, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't give a shit. Now, good. but he would never take his hat off for years. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Years. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, doesn't matter where you were. Yeah, baby. Would never take his hat off. And you knew something was going on underneath well, there. Well, yeah. And eventually, all of a sudden, one day, he just stopped wearing it. I mean, we're talking, this was like 10, 15 years straight. That's old school shit. Never though. not having a hat on. And everyone was like, what the hell is going on underneath that hat? He'll never take it off. And somebody's just got to knock it off. People would say, that's gutless somebody's people. just going to knock that's it off. That's fucking gutless so, of people do that, by the so, way. So the anxiety that comes with losing your hair, your hair, man. And, I, and I'm starting to get a little, little thin no, up I know. top. Okay? And gray. No big deal. Oh, uh, I could, we, we that could, gray, once I get a haircut, the gray goes away. Who gives a fuck about the gray? And Die I, the motherfucker. And, and I don't care. But, you know, but we're in, this is quarantine life, baby. Fuck yeah, Kate's and I, cutting my hair too, by the way. And I've got gray hair, so like once I get a haircut, the hair, you know, the gray Good, hair. You look older and now. And I got a French Canadian beautiful hairdresser, Annie, and she'll come cut it all out anyway. Annie. That's what I heard. Yeah. She <laughs> loves Annie. Annie. She, lo- so she loves me. That's the only reason why he gets haircuts. Oh, go yeah, see she, fucking Annie. She loves me, and I got a personal trainer on Peloton who I'll it see later count. on today. That doesn't count. That okay? doesn't count. So. Tell us about your life story. Why, why are we talking about I my hair loss? We're I fucking talking about... Because you put a video out the other day. People are curious. They pay me. Look, here's the deal. <laughs> they my, pay me. <laughs> my hair was... I was losing my fucking hair. Every time I got into a fight, or even in warm-ups when I wore no bucky, some of the boys would say, Ooh, Cam. Ooh, I can see, Are you losing your hair? I'm like, oh, my word. Would I'm they? losing my fucking... Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. And it dug into me a little bit. Um, but anyway, no, it, it, yeah, it, and I'll tell you this right now. I started losing early, or mid-20s, right? And it didn't matter. It didn't matter at that point. But once I started my 30s, early 30s, and I remember being my last year in, um, in, in, in the American League, I was going through a tough time, a real tough time, on multiple levels of different things we don't need to get into right now. But I was, I was getting tested three times a week. I was hurt. What were they testing you for? Oh, piss test three times a fucking week. In the NHL? I don't give a shit. I'm going to tell you right now. In the NHL? In the, no, in the American League. Okay. So it's the same Dr. Shaw, Dr. fucking Lewis. What, what, Dr. Shaw's also. How does this look. happen? Somebody knocks on your door? At 5 o'clock in the mother... On the road, on at home, or Every what? motherfucking three times a week. So you know it's coming. Andy. You know it's coming. Three times a fucking week, they drug test me. And my wife and I would have to get up. I'd get up at 4 fucking o'clock. You know what I'd do? I'd slam a gallon of fucking water at 4 o'clock in the morning. You have pee for you? No, no, no. No, because they watch my fucking pee, motherfucker. Oh, they watch you do it. This fucking bald guy who's jacked would follow me everywhere I go. He'd come in at my house at 5 o'clock in the fucking morning. I'd let him in like, get the fuck in there. Let's go. Let's get it done. I'd slam a gallon of motherfucking water. Poor Kate couldn't fucking sleep in. I'd have to piss in front of this man. I'd piss fucking water. Like, there you go. It's all water. Take it and like it. Poor guy, he was actually very nice. I was very nice to him. I didn't miss a fucking skip of fucking... What were they testing you for? Weed. Why, did you have a failed test? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a failed test, and, um, you know, it, it calmed me down. And I had a failed test, and I had to piss, and they would threaten me to take me to fucking... They would threaten me to take me to... Um, rehab? Uh, rehab, and I go, oh, really? Oh, you're going to take me to rehab? Oh, Really? After I got done going through painkiller abuse and fucking shit, and now you're worried about me for weed? Wait, hold on. Then they'd threaten me to take me to rehab, and I'd be like, if I walk into rehab and they put me on stage, and they go, hey, Cam, what are you here for? I'm here for weed. Oh, really, you fucking loser? Get out of here. I'm fucking snorting heroin every fucking night. I'm sucking dick for coke, and you're here for fucking weed? Okay. Like, it just was a goddamn mess. Probably crack, not coke, by the way. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You could do it for both. Okay. You're a, it's a very addictive drug, and I don't mean to chirp it that much, but fucking people are hardcore in there, and they needed it. And I'm there for I'm like, oh, that's going to go well. 
oh yeah like i'm it just was a biggest mess and i remember looking at myself in the mirror and be like oh god my hair is growing i was so stressed out man i was injured i didn't know what my future was i didn't know i was gonna be on radio i didn't you know you're spending money i get suspended every goddamn day then i get hurt i'm looking at myself in the mirror i'm losing my fucking hair yeah it sucked but you okay. know what but time out yeah. you know what now i got a sponsor hans wyman baby <laughs> They pay me every month, okay. and my hair's growing back. I look like motherfucking Fabio. I look like Tristan from fucking Legends of the Fall. Take it and like it, motherfuckers. My hair's growing back, baby, and I, I'm getting so paid. So I, I don't want to do like an endorsement here for Hans Wyman or the Hair Club for Men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, because like, I mean, I can't believe. He, I always wondered who went to Hans Wyman, and there's like big boys, do, lots baby. of people like big you. And women. Did you lose your voice? Like Joe Buck, didn't he go to uh, have some I don't, hair dude, plugs dude, or something? No, no, those are hair it's plugs. It's in his book. That's, that, that's old school shit. That's mid '90s shit. Joe Buck did mid '90s shit, homie. They changed. How all bad it. does it hurt? That, oh, well, <laughs> doesn't feel good. But actually, the surgery is not bad. They the put key, you out. The, you know, yeah, I fucking was drooling on the nurses. I'm watching again Legends of the Fall because I wanted to see Tristan how beautiful he was with that long blonde flowing hair. And every time I'm watching it, drooling on myself, they fed me there and they're working on my head. And I'm like, oh god, look at Tristan. He's so sexy. I'm gonna motherfucking look like him. And I do now, Andy. So it's surgery. Yeah, they just they 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 take a strip off, no cut. Whose hair is that? It's mine from the back is of that my like, head. They put like Brandon Press hair in your head, so you just like. I'd take that. <laughs> I'd take that. It's funny how you bring a guy with a full head of hair into the picture. I take his like head Brandon, hair. Brandon, we take a, a couple no, samples. I want to explain to you, and then they no, weave it into your me, head. The, I'm curious. You're gonna fucking ask me. I want to know. I'm gonna answer it. Hans Wyman, I'll tell you this: they take a strip out of your back of your head, but it's not a strip. It's no scar or anything. Look at mm-hmm. back of my head. They just pluck out the big, the, the back of your head's the thickest part. So they, they pluck big uh, two-haired cells out of there. Mm-hmm. They keep it, and they put it on the top of your head or the back of your crown. And so there's no scar. There's no anything like that. How long is the procedure? Uh, three hours. So if you never had that procedure, you'd have like a skullet on the back of your head? Like you'd be, Oh, you'd, I'd be bald. Oh, yeah. Like I'd full-on sh- bald. Oh, yeah. I was losing it so fast, Andy. I swear to God. And I'd be fucking bald. Like Can a you comb it with a regular like, brush? Do you use real shampoo out. and all that Time stuff? Out. I love Hans Wyman. But if I was bald right now, I'd look like Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> but I'm the I, I could do that. Andy, if you went bald, you look like fucking Stone Cold Steve Austin's little brother who's fucking bizarro, who did <laughs> who wasn't fed when he was young. No, I'm just saying it it doesn't work for some people. It works for me. Um, anyway, All is right. this a long promotion for how are we talking I don't know. hockey? Like, we what need, are we, we doing? We need to get them on board now, is what we need. Well, they are on board with me. Talking hockey. <laughs> what, what, what hockey? What hockey are we talking about? Oh, my God. Isn't that funny how we could just talk Dude. about my fucking hair loss, mm-hmm. my cussing problem? What other problems do I have? All right, have? let's get into something else here. Okay, good. So, Ben Bishop is on this episode. Yes. Here on episode 35. The greatest goaltender to ever come out of St. Louis, hands down, not even close. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, not yeah, even yeah. close. Absolutely. And, you know, by the way, I do have my top 50. Players to ever come is out. Is that ever going to come out? Have you got the green light for that yet? Yeah, like, I'm going to be honest here. Well, I, I I came up with the list. I can do it whenever I want, but I'm trying to go through the right procedure. Through yeah, a, yeah, well, yeah. no, I'm trying to have it promoted the right way on a different platform. I know what you're trying to say. So I'm trying to you know hold on to that. Uh, but but Bish, dude, like he he was a couple years younger than you, right? Yeah, yeah. Three years younger. Yeah, I played with him though. Yeah, you did. Yes, I played with him with St. Louis. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. St. Louis. Yes. In not, St. Not Louis, growing up. No. But my question yeah, yeah, yeah. No, was. No, no, yeah. Did you know who he was? As Absolutely, a kid? we know, all knew each other. Did you know this kid was going to be a stud? Yeah, he's six foot seven. Well, he wasn't then. No, yeah, he was. When he was a kid. Every time I saw him, he was fucking. But a, when, a he, lot when he got to the was. NHL, you knew right away this guy was going to be good. I, I don't know. Look, he look, did. You want you want to ask me that question and me be completely honest with you? Mm-hmm. I don't know shit about goalies. Mm-hmm. I saw him like, oh look at this tall drink of water. You know how else I said that too? Yeah. Alex Petrangelo when he walked in, me and Dan Hynot looking at him like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you're going to make it. And he did. And yeah. now he's going to have a fucking statue but, but if he signs I, a contract. I bet other people probably have that opinion, too. Well, I'm just looking at Ben Bishop, and he was a nice kid. He was quiet. He's from St. Louis. You just, you, I don't, you don't know goalies, man. Goalies are weird, but God dang, he's six foot seven. He figured it out, and now mm-hmm. look at him. He's Dude, fucking he's awesome. Like- Good guy, man. All world, man. Good guy. And he is dude. a great guy. He's a good kid. So you'll learn yeah. a lot about him here on this uh, yeah. edition of the Camus Strip. He doesn't have podcast. hair loss problems. If he does, he goes Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Right. How's his hair? His hair's good. It's not It's not Fabio like mine, mm-hmm. but it's there. It's there. He's going to live here in St. Louis when his career's done, too. I know. We asked him that. I hope he buys a fucking mansion. I go, Bish, go buy 100 acres, build a motherfucking castle, he'll and be, have parties, He'll be living out baby. by me. He won't be living out by dude. you. Oh, the poor part will do? Yeah, I don't think so. He's going to buy your whole subdivision out and build a fucking compound. 
Well, he won't be living out. He won't be. He won't be living out by you, or you have no internet. Okay. Like, That's not funny. See how he fucking bullshits me? I got the fucking mayor from Eureka have, coming on my have, show tomorrow. They don't have internet. Internet. They, are you out of your fucking Where mind? Where you live? They don't have internet. I'm a tweeting a tweeting machine, dude. I ha- you, in order to have Twitter, dude, you have to have fucking. He internet. was looking at this house. That's not far from him, and he said that it has no internet. You can't See, get that's internet. A problem. It's no, like a mile away from your house. Yeah, but when, if if the Jansen family moves in anywhere, the internet connection is going to be okay. Like, how do you not have internet out there? Because I'm not there yet. Mm. But if my family moves out there, they take care of us. It is what it is because I okay. got fucking sick-ass hair. Ben Bishop, you know, we talked about it a little bit, though. Like Game 7. Did you feel bad for him at all when they lost? Yeah, I mean, yeah, a little bit. I was pretty I was pretty banged up, and Losey was with me, and Kate was mm-hmm. filming this whole time, and I almost pulled a growing jumping over something. But, yeah, at the time, afterwards, when everything settled down, I'm like, you know what, Benny Bishop, I feel bad for you. But you know what, that, that picture of him and Patty hugging each other with the yeah. St. Louis flag, and I fucking hate Bish. You're yeah. part of history, man. I don't fuck, think man. that I, good, that, that picture is more likely to be hung up in Pat's house than Ben Bishop's house. I'll just say that. No, I, I know. We brought that up. And I, and I never forget. <laughs> I'll never forget watching, looking at his family. They were right next to our suite. Yeah. And just seeing their reaction, man, I mean, I, I honestly felt bad for them. I gave him a, a huge hug, actually, inside the dressing room when I was in there, did an interview with him after the game. Yeah. And he was actually in a way better mood than you would think. Sometimes it's you just You know, like, he was just kind of yeah. like laughing and smiling, like, you know, somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose. Yeah. I think he knew he played unbelievable. Unreal. So was probably sick. the best player on the, on ice, the ice in the game. Yep. No doubt about For that. For either team. And don't get me wrong, Benner fucking made some dirty ass yeah. fucking oh, saves. He did, Remember man. the one? He did. He the did. Jamie Ben wrap oh, yeah. around. Right where before, he's like, Fuck just, this. just before Patty scored. It's like, remember we talked about And by the yeah. way, we're about a year away from uh, that anniversary. We may have something special for you know, Ooh. coming your way anyway. So check that out. A little tease. Check little that out. Tease. So anyway, Ben Bishop, man, all world. I hope yep. he wins a Vezina Trophy one of these years, sure. too. You know, he's been a finalist a couple times and, you know, hasn't been able to, to crack through and win it, man. But he should because everyone respects this guy as, without question, one of the top three, four goaltenders in the entire world Yep, right now. I know. He's unreal. Hey, uh, as always, this is brought to you by our boy Dan Bellman, man. Fuck, this, he this plays video cool games. This guy's cool as shit, Fuck, is he not? He, cool? he texted us the other day. He's like, camera, I'm playing fucking call. I go, you're a video game I go, Word. I go, let's do this, baby. I go, fucking play Bloodborne. He's like, no, I'm not into that. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a, he's like, I'm a first person shooter kind of guy. I'm like, I love you, dude. You're the coolest guy. He knows hockey. He sells great cars. He hooks you up. He takes care of the people in St. Louis. The dude does it all. I just want everything to open up, Andy, mm-hmm. so we can go hang out with him. No, we're gonna, we're gonna go, we're gonna go hang out. We're gonna head down to the dealership too. I know. And shoot some videos of me driving in my new Escalade, man. I'm waiting for that new Escalade to be dropped off. 24 at my house. 24 And I ordered. I said you can get Cam a pink Jeep with little wheels, a two door Jeep, dude, with little wheels. Here, Dan, I'm gonna fucking talk to you right now, one on one, baby. <laughs> Dan, you can give me a pink fucking Jeep with pussy ass tires on it. I'll make that thing rock and roll in Eureka, baby. I'll have no top on that thing with my long flowing hair, and I'll fly around Eureka, and people will be like, "What's up, Cam? Yeah. I don't give a shit if you have a pink Jeep." Because you're the man. All right, Bellman.com. You know how to spell Bellman again? B-E-H. Oh, God. Stop. Don't ask me questions. I can't. B-E-L-H-M-A-N. No, H-L-M-A-N. No. What? B-E-H-L-M-A-N-N. H-L. I'm looking at my producer right now, and I'm like, motherfucker, I got one of those right. I think it was the second one. So you said no one. www.behlmann.com. I knew that. Check it out. Pre-owned, new Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram. I want to hit that. We've got to hit that up, by the way. We need Escalades, dude. Well, I want to Escalade. I want an Escalade, too, With now. the Cadillac Buick GMC. 20 foals on that mug. I'm telling you, man. Pen- so I want my I want pink, my, I want my pink Escalade. Pink 24s. I want pink 24s. I want my Escalade. And you can go hook yourself up with a new Jeep or a Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, whatever you want. Bellman.com. And, of course, our girl, Renee Howitt. Oh, yeah. With... Cope24.com. We appreciate everything they do for us. we got a big event coming up later in the year. Once we fight through Corona, we're going to be having an unreal event Bagging coming corona. up at the end of 2020, celebrating Cope24. And we got to give a shout-out to our boys here at the uh, Normal Brand, yes, by the way. by the way. And they'll come to you. They've got, like, merchandise on wheels. They turned their, your driveway into a store. Yeah, dude. Go check out their clothes. They get the best clothing, honestly. Yes. Like, it's like a unique style mm-hmm. that fits with anything. You wear it to nice places. You can go hunting with it. You could do this. It's like LL Bean times ten. Yeah, like it's like a 
Oh, it Hugo is. Boss, L.L. Bean mixed together, kind mm-hmm. of thing. and Lululemon mixed in there. <laughs> you like that, too? Yeah. I love Hugo and Lulu. You know that. <laughs> Norm Brown's like a mixture of both. No doubt. No doubt. So check that out. Again, no corona on the clothes. Nah. Six feet away. Yeah. Fully sanitized. They'll come to your house. Basically, just turn your, your driveway into a little miniature, the normal brand store. So check out all their incredible products there online. All right. Ben Bishop, our boy, six yeah. foot seven, full of talent. This guy... Basically introduced himself in a charity game. You'll hear about it in this interview as Big Ben comes your way here on the Cam and Strick podcast. We all knew each other, hockey and all that stuff. Very tight-knit hockey community here in St. Louis. Um, but we dealt with a little bit of tornadoes. But we, what happened with that? Like, were you guys home? Because didn't Sagan's house get rocked too? Yeah, we were home. It was uh, Sunday night because we were watching the football game. And... Whatever the the sirens were going off, but you know, being from St. Louis, the sirens go off all the time, and yeah, nothing ever really happens. You kind of like, oh, the sirens are going off, like it must be bad, but you never think it's actually going to hit, you know, where you are. And so we were watching. I was looking out the window, and the trees were starting to blow a little bit harder. And I'm watching the football game, which is on you know cable, and there's no weather warning sign or anything. So me, you know, being you know who I am, I'm like, oh, I'll go outside and look to see what it's like. So I like walk outside, look at the trees, like, oh, it looks kind of bad. My wife, you know, screams at, at me. She's like, there's a tornado, you know, at Royal the Tollway, which is like less than two miles from the house. Oh my god! So I ran into like got my son, and we ran into our bathroom because that's the other thing in Dallas. There's no there's no basements. So it was like we ran into our bathroom because there's no windows and stuff in there. And, even then, I still wasn't too worried, and all of a sudden, it started getting real windy, and next thing you know, we were, our bedroom windows were breaking, and then it was about, I don't know, it seemed like, you know, 20 seconds of, I mean, I was, like, hovering over my wife and kid at this point, oh. like, kind of fight or flight mode, and, like, what's going on, like, what's going on, and it went through real quick, and then, obviously, all the lights were out and everything, and we had, there's so much just debris, like, these you know, wood or like went through our windows and we went outside and it was, it was just a disaster. There's trees down everywhere. And then one of my teammates came over, Jamie Ben, check on me, went back to his house, you know, spent the night at his house. We like boarded up the windows. And then it wasn't until the next morning when I came back and I saw, you know, two streets down for me in our neighborhood. I mean, that house, that, that street got wiped out. You know, 90% of the people on that street aren't living in their homes anymore. Wow. Like, roofs ripped off. God. Everything. It was, you know, straight out of a movie. I remember, uh, like, the next day, because like, you sent me some pictures because I was asking, like, if you were okay. You never know when you're from a distance, bitch, if it's all that serious, you know? Like, And, and then all of a sudden, when you sent those and then seeing some of the footage, like, you don't really put the connection of Dallas being a tornado city. Like, while it's going on, you said you're over your wife and your kid. Like, were you oh, scared, God. or did you feel like everything was going to be cool? You just had to wait it out. Well, I didn't really know what was happening, you know, and it wasn't really – and it went through so quick. I mean, even when the sirens were going off and she said there was a tornado close, I, you know, we ran to the bathroom. I wasn't too worried. It wasn't until I could hear my bedroom windows breaking, oh, and then you could, hear this, you could hear it kind of come through. You know, you could hear the debris like hitting the house, and that's when you're kind of like, "Oh, like, is is like your roof going to get ripped off?" And then it kind of kind of goes through, and you're like, oh, "Okay, well, that wasn't too bad." And like I said, it wasn't until you kind of also we went outside, and all of our you know, I had a huge tree down on on our garage, and you know, but it wasn't terrible. And then we were probably 200 yards away from you know having our house ripped apart. Dude, isn't that fucked up that Oklahoma and I guess most parts of Texas don't have basements, but they have shelters. But I guess because it's kind of clay, the ground's clayish, so they don't have basements like they do in, let's say, like Missouri for the most part. So you're just like you're so fucking vulnerable. Like, well, what do I do? Uh, okay, go to the the just most central part of my house. But even then, man, that thing could have fucked. I don't know. That's horrifying. We got almost got hit down in Nashville a couple weeks ago. Uh, we left the day before. Nashville got rocked. Yeah, I mean, they're scary because they, they come out of nowhere. Yeah, you know, like you said, unless, I mean, at least in St. Louis now, like, you go to the basement and stuff and, yeah, a little bit of, you know, coverage. But, yeah, I mean, if I were to build a house in Dallas, I definitely have some type of 
safer in your shelter. <laughs> you're, you're, not Tampa, you're not in Tampa anymore. <laughs> you know? I mean, with the palm trees and the weather. Was there ever any crazy weather in Tampa? Or no, no hurricanes, nothing like that, right? I mean, the storms, they had a hurricane, you know, the year after I left. But even those, you, you see them coming, so you have time to prepare. Jeez. Oh. Yeah, you do have time, but people don't down there, though. It's a different world, man. Every you played in a lot of different places, but I guess well, Tampa must have been fun, though. Like, I like going down there. The rink's right there. You know, we stayed. You could walk right to the rink. I mean, yeah, the weather's kind of funky here and there, but for the most part, it's warm. There's things to do. Like, you, did you like living there? Where would you live, by the way? I was right across the street from the rink, so it was oh, right yeah. there in that area. And, you know, I could walk, to, walk across the street, but yeah, no, I mean, it's beautiful. It's funny. I, I guess kind of one of the things you learn down there is when you tell people you played – you know, in Ottawa before that, people that are from Florida, they're always like, how could you live in, you know, Canada? Like, it's freezing. Like, why would you do that? And like, even St. Louis, they say the same thing. You're like, well, you're yeah. used to it. You know, you just learn to live with it, you know, yada, yada, yada. Well, like, after four years in Tampa, I'm sitting there like, how would you ever live in Canada? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Your mindset changes real quick. It's pretty funny how, how it happens. But Tampa must have been fun, though, man. I mean, it's kind of like a, I don't want to say under the radar, but people don't automatically mention it as the nicest places to live in the NHL. They always mention one or two other places before that. But you had to be pretty comfortable there, man. I mean, was it, is that where your wife's from, too? Is that where you met your wife? Yeah, that's where I met my wife. She's from Salt Pete, which is just, you know, on the other side of the bay there. But, yeah, I would say it's one of the best places to play as far as, you know, city, weather, you know, community. It's not a big city, but it's not too small of a city. Obviously, the weather's top notch, and you're about a 30 minute drive to the beach. And, you know, it's a great setup around the rink, and obviously, a great owner and whatnot. So, it's definitely a great place to play. And uh, you can see why guys want to play there. Who was you play with some big dogs around there, though? And yeah. St. Louis, wait, like, so you got St. Louis, you got Vinny LeCavier, who's from what I heard is not going to pick up a check at the bar. But then you got <laughs> Stammer, and you got all these guys like, who, who ran the show? Like, who who walked in the locker room, listened to everybody, kind of organized events, things like that? Well, I think when I first got there, you know, it was Marty St. Louis. He was obviously the captain, and, you know, had the most respect. And Vinny was there just that first little bit I was there. And But there's a good crew. I mean, there was, like, Nate Thompson, Teddy Purcell, Ryan Malone, Stamkos, Purcell. They're a pretty veteran group as far as – uh, even like Sammy Sallow was on the team. Oh, yeah. Uh, we had a, a really good team, like looking back on it, as far as just cast characters and everybody kind of did their part. It was a lot of fun to be a part of. But yeah, and Marty was hilarious, you know, for being, you know, Hall of Famer that he is. He definitely knew how to, let, you know, be serious and keep it light at the same time. He definitely had that, you know, that going for him as far as, you know, he could be funny and light, but serious at the same time. Mitch, what's it like for a young guy? I know you've been in the league for a little while there. You were in Ottawa, obviously, and you know, you've been you know, up and down with St. Louis. But young guy, you want to snap again. I mean, that's where you really came out of the scene as an NHL goalie in Tampa. But, like, when you get there, you just mentioned all these names. Was it intimidating for you? What's it like for a young guy just trying to, to find their way as an NHL goalie with all these established players around you? Well, I think, I, you know, I was in Ottawa for – you know, two seasons prior to that, you know, from the lockout to the deadline. And then when I got traded from there to the end of playoffs the year before. So, I mean, I played with Alfie and Spezza and some guys. So I think, you know, the starstruckness kind of, kind of goes away. It's just more mm-hmm. trying to, you know, you know, get to a new team and kind of find your niche and, you know, just keep your mouth shut and try to, you know, show that you can do it on the ice. Uh, and that was just kind of my approach is I knew it was kind of my opportunity to, you know, be an NHL goalie. So I was kind of more focused on that and kind of let you, you know, your play do the talking. Hey, remember, so we, we, we have brief stint together. I'm actually in my office right now, Bish, and I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at the, you're sitting in front, I'm looking at one of the pictures of the team pictures and you're right by Jackson. I'm looking at all the guys in that team, the hilarious team that we had kind of finding <laughs> our own, you know, but your first start was Manny. And if anybody knows Manny Legacy, like he just, like you look at the guy and compared to you, Bish, is like the, the biggest difference in height ever in existence on any hockey player's uh, teammates ever. Uh, but he blows a tire 
and he busts his knee up, and then you get your first start. I know that's not funny. Sorry, Manny, but it kind of is. I remember him doing that when he was walking out. Hey, what's her name? The the presidential candidate. It was get... uh, uh, Sarah Palin, dude. Sarah Palin. Remember that? Remember that? I'll Andy, never forget the, Oh, the red carpet. I, and you just wondered, like, <laughs> what is going on? It's right by the, you know, the, the entry onto the ice from the bench, you know, and all of a sudden oh. he steps on it. And you're yeah, like, did he just get hurt? This is we're crazy. all going out in the ice. We're all going and, out in the ice. They kept it there. Oh, and Blues personnel, by the way. And I'll let you answer the question here, bitch. But they were like, hey, let's not make a big deal out of this. Let's not, <laughs> let's not say much about this here. I'm like, what do you mean? Did you just step on the carpet? You're like, you're starting goaltenders. <laughs> so, man, you had to be ready pretty quickly. Did you know it was serious right away, bitch? You remember that? I, it was my second game. You know, I got called up the first game, and it was against Detroit. And I, you know, I was just, I remember being nervous the entire time just because, you know, obviously your first NHL game, even though you weren't playing, you're sitting there. So I was, you know, super nervous. And that was the second game that I was up for. I think we had a practice or two in between. So, you know, playing at home, being from St. Louis, it's like, you know, right before the game starts, you get on the ice. And this time, you know, I was a little more relaxed, kind of skating around, like looking in the crowd, like, you know, this is awesome type deal. And then it was Danny Heinout came up to me. It's like, bitch, man, he, you know, tweaked his groin or whatnot. He's like, be ready to go in. And my heart dropped so fast. <laughs> you know, and he ended up playing the first period, but every save he'd make, you know, he'd wins. So I think it was halfway through the first period that I ended up I ended up getting up and just going into the back hallway and, like, stretching because I was so nervous, you know. <laughs> I, just, you're just, well, I remember that. You know, like, he, he was just, every time he did something, he was just like, oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah. Like, okay, just get him out. Like, what are we doing here? Like, you know, I don't think they wanted to get him out because then it would, it was the embarrassment factor just skyrockets because you know he's hurt because of that. Oh, but hey, that's not funny though how just different things happen, man. And you're like, all right, shit, all right, I'm up, fuck, let's go. So I, I get it, man. That's that's hilarious. So Manny legacy. It's almost probably better that way, you know, not having to prepare, just get thrown in the fire. Yeah, just go. I would think he'd be a decent partner, right, for for a young guy, Manny Legacy, just knowing his personality. Like, did you ever have a partner who who wasn't bitch, who just treated you like shit, like that? You just were like, this guy is just out of control. Or have all your partners, at least when you were young, been pretty good to you? Yeah, I mean, I was so lucky. I think growing up, you know, coming to the organization because I had Manny, who was so good to me. You know, Conklin, and then Mace, yeah. uh, and then when I went to you know, Ottawa, you know, even Alex Ald was great to me. And all those guys, you know, helped me so much, you know, from, you know, Manny to Collins to me. Obviously, those are you know, some of the nicest guys I've ever, you know, met or played with. So those guys are always helping me and they made it a lot easier on me. And it's kind of one off, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's like, you know, these kids coming up now. I mean, you kind of want to help them out because I remember just what those guys did for me and how much it helped. And I'll never forget it. So I try to, you know, kind of pass it down like those guys did to me. Yeah, growing up playing for Kirkwood, you know, you played forward to shit, bitch. You probably could have fucking made the NHL as a forward or a D man. You would have been Chris Pronger, but it's like, oh, you know, I'm going to change it up and play goal. <laughs> Who knows? Like, you play, why did you decide to play goalie anyway? Uh, you know, I probably I wish it was, I wish I was a forward in the NHL right now. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, crush guys, beat up everybody. <laughs> no, I mean, we all took turns playing goalie, and I guess selfishly, you know, I got to play the whole game, so I liked, I didn't like coming off the ice, so I said I wanted to do it, and, you know, just kind of stuck with it. I, I mean, you know, being from St. Louis, it's not like we ever thought we were going to make the NHL, and then all of a sudden, next thing, you know, one thing leads to the other, and I mean, Cam, you're the first one, so when, when, you, when you did it, and then we started working out with you, you know, and I'd get drafted. It just followed in Cam's footsteps, you know? Well, I knew I was going to make it since I was like 10, dude. I was bragging to everybody, although <laughs> I didn't know, but I was still bragging to people. Oh, shit. So how did you choose to be, be a goalie dish? It was just everybody took a turn, and, you know, it was my turn. And I, I guess I I liked it, and I was pretty good at it. So, they, you know, they're like, all right, you can say a goalie. And I, I liked it because I didn't have to come off the ice. <laughs> Yeah, he just you, he just answered that same question, Andy. You didn't hear the first time. No, I don't. So we, I don't. You know, I don't listen. I, uh, over my head. I, I can't even hear. Cam, you're just. I get a am I breathing? I'm listening to Cam the whole time. He am I breathing? So hard, I can't even hear. So the well, you, gotta, 
bitch, you got to understand, like, we do this now. We're in quarantine life, dude. So I do it from my office. Andy does it. We usually are by each other, but you can't do that now. So we're still getting used to that. Sometimes I breathe in the, the phone. Sometimes I don't. But anyway, <laughs> you, you played and you started to play well. You went up, you played Quebec. You went to Quebec tourney. You kind of got your groove on. Then you went to Sh uh, Chaminade. But then you played the, the North American League. And you played for the Texas Tornado, which is kind of a cool thing. You've already been down to Texas a little bit. And I remember you showed me a video one time of you playing. I believe you were playing for Texas at the time. And you get into a goalie fight. And you skate all the way up to center ice, right? And everybody screams, get him, Benny. Get him. Yeah. And you're like, fuck this. I'm doing it. And you go over there and you start bagging this other kid up. Wasn't that, oh, that was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was good, yeah. I mean, it was one of those things that the announcer makes it almost 10 times better than what it really was. Uh, I think he won an award for like the best call in Dallas that year, even like on all the pro sports teams. Oh, really? But uh, it was awesome. Yeah. I, know. I mean, I was probably working out with you back then. So I had to follow, you know, I know you might as well beat somebody up. I mean, good <laughs> God, but uh, yeah, then you go to the main too. I mean, how, how, how'd that all come about? Well, once I got down here, it was, uh, it wasn't, I guess, a couple months in, and then my coach gave up to me down here, and he, he's like, you know, you're on the central scouting list for the draft, and I had absolutely no idea, and I was like, oh, really? Like, like the NHL draft? He's like, yeah, uh, but then he like, he's like, well, you still suck, so it skated away. Like that was, uh, you know, Tony Grutale is one of those coaches where he would tell you oh. something, but then keep you humble real quick. Yep. And so I was kind of one of those things, and all of a sudden, colleges started showing interest and I mean it happened so fast because I honestly came down here just trying to make the team and the next thing you know you're on the you know scouting list for the draft and all of a sudden all these colleges start you know calling you and wanting to go to dinner with you I talked to quite a few schools and Maine was my first visit we kind of had narrowed it down to you know there was a few schools out there where goalies tended to do really well in those universities and and, you know, my first visit was Maine and they offered, you know, offered the scholarship. So it was kind of a no brainer because I think the eight goalies before me all played in the NHL at Maine. So it's kind of what it was like Maine and Michigan are two big, you know, goalie schools as well as, you know, producing goalies. So once the, you know, Maine offered, it was kind of a no brainer. That's unreal. The eight goalies before you, they all made it to the National Hockey League. Like who, yeah. who else is in that mix besides uh, uh, who else is in Jimmy Hyman? Uh, Gar Snow, Mike Dunham, Mike Morrison, Alfie Mishu. Um, there's a few others too. Uh, I I remember you playing in the Frozen Four here in St. Louis. I mean, like, were, were you nervous in that tournament? I mean, I know it was back to back, for, you know, Frozen Four trips for you. Yeah, I think always, you know, you know, you're a little bit more nervous going back because I was drafted by the Blues by then. So, kind of going back to St. Louis, being drafted by the Blues, Frozen Four, it was just kind of. But once the puck drops, obviously, it's not like you're nervous anymore, but it was a little more pressure. Uh, you know, I was unfortunately played in two Frozen Fours in both games. You know, when you play that NCAA, you know, single elimination game, it's kind of, we had some bad bounces both games. So we Frozen Fours we played in, kind of weird, goofy goals going in. So it's a little unfortunate, but, you know, still pretty cool to play in the Frozen Four with, you know, on ESPN with Gary Thorne, you know, announcing. So oh, yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> Gary he Thorne went to Maine, too. too. Yeah, he Gary went to Thorne. Maine. We got to get yeah. him on, man. He's like, listen, you love him, some of these old school, oh, watching some of these old school hockey games, he, He's might the be, he might be the greatest hockey announcer. On and on video games. And on video games. Remember those video games back in the day? He was yeah. just into it. Just no, like no, the no, announcer awesome. with your fight. Hey, it's you remember how it all started, though, bitch? You got to tell the story about during the 4 5 lockout. How a charity game, like all these NHL superstars camp were like putting on this game. I don't know why you weren't playing in the game camp. Uh, I knew <laughs> it was coming. <laughs> it, was, it, it was like, uh, you know, but Al and Pronger, Ronald was there, Gary Roberts, Joe Newendike, and I know I'm missing a bunch of guys who came in. They packed the house at the family arena. People hadn't watched hockey in forever. And so how did, how did it work out where you got the call and you were in the game? So I'll never forget you playing in the game and just standing on your head you walking out of the arena, like all your family's there. It was like, you're like 10 years old. They're like all clapping their hands. Cause like you were like unbelievable. And then the blues drafted you a few months later. It was pretty wild. I mean, Kelly Chaser called me and he was asking me if I wanted to play in this. I want to say he even said it was like alumni charity game type deal. 
and I was I was down here in Dallas because our season had just ended, and I was I was thinking, yeah, okay, and I was thinking it was I was thinking it was just one of those charity games with like the Blues alumni, mm-hmm. and you know that was it. I'd probably out at you know Kirkwood or Chesterfield, and he's like, okay, I'll. Fl- uh, I probably could say now, but he's like, I'll fly in on Friday. It's like it's rules. I'll fly in on Friday or whatever. He's playing a game and, you know, fly home at the end of the week, go back to school on Monday. So I just remember I flew up Friday morning and I got in the car. I think I even had like a limo. I picked up like a limo in from the airport to the family arena. And I get to the family arena. I'm the first person there because it's pretty early. And I remember I walk into the locker room and he's like, Bert and Ray, all the trainers are there, and I look, the roster is like on the door, and I had absolutely no idea. This is probably like before like the internet was that big to like you know look it up on your phone. I saw the roster on the door, and I was like my jaw dropped because it was, I mean, just like an all star game, and I was the only non NHL player I think in the game. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Was was what was this then? It was unbelievable because I remember what was being it? there and like. And like down there in the morning and like hanging out with like a lot of the, the players who were playing in it, we were promoting it for weeks, you know. So I, like I was young and just doing a, you know a ton of interviews and stuff, and they were making a huge deal out of it. There was no hockey cam. I mean, all the Blues brass, oh, the they're like scouting. Yeah, yeah. They're the like old scouting. Floor. They're like scouting the game. Like Larry Plows, they're scouting his entire staff. Like they're like watching the game like with like Bish, pencils Bish. and stuff, and they're watching Bish play. Because I remember I was in the yeah. locker room. It was yeah. like I, I sat down and I was sitting between I think Pronger and Brett Hall. Was like the guy two guys sitting next to me. Oh my god! <laughs> because I and think how it was like old the, were you? Like sixteen, seventeen? Uh, oh yeah, but in like my senior year in high school, seventeen, eighteen. That's but that I weird? remember it was like the Blues players because I think it was like Hall and like Pronger. I mean, I think McInnes. Lowe, McInnes. And then the other team was like Roenick, Newendike, Adam. Oh Lowe, my god! Uh, <laughs> Gary <laughs> Roberts, <laughs> like. But they were all still playing Cam. It wasn't like they were. Well, like, it was. In the, I know what he's talking about now, though, Andy, because in, in, in we do this all like we put these events on now, and you got to think about it. Goalie, like that happened to uh, Bone the other day when we had the alumni game. Andy, remember that the alumni game where I fought Biz? Mm-hmm. Oh, one Curtis Joseph couldn't play, so all of a sudden they get this kid, and and Chaser knew you because of the North American Hockey League, so he's like, "Fuck this, let me get, at least get this local kid in here and see if he stands on his head." And that was a tryout. <laughs> that, that, seriously, it was. Imagine it was an audition. Up. It was an he audition. Stood, Cam, he stood on his head, man. Like they couldn't. Like Andy, it happened to me. Trying, but Cam, man, like you know, Fish is young, and obviously trying. Like I mean, he's playing like one of the best games of his life. Like they couldn't score on him. He was like, you know, oh, I started the game. It was hilarious. I could picture it too. But Larry Poe honestly was watching it, just like Andy. You always chirped me about this when I mm-hmm. when the Blues used to invite me out there, and I would race with the guys. That's how Larry Plo saw me to, for the trade. I mean, it all coexists together, man. So Chaser hooked you up on that one, Vinny. He did. He still thinks that. Hey, you can't, bitch, honestly, you think you get drafted by the Blues? Like in the third round, too. It wasn't like you were buried in the draft. If, yeah, if you don't, don't, if know, you don't play in that event. That's a great question. I guess that's probably more of a question for Larry. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't know the Blues were even on the radar as far as you know, the draft was concerned. Uh, hey, I have asked Larry, and he says no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think they do draft you. You're not saying you don't get drafted. You're not a star on the NHL, but I don't know if they draft you in the third round there. Not that it's not, yeah. you, know? you never do it seriously. What that kind of shit. Uh, Brandon Prost talked about something uh, the other day. He's like, I'm, I, I, uh, Dale Hunter thought that I was playing in college, and I really wasn't. And all of a sudden, my dad met up with him in a golf course because they hit him the hit into them and he's like hey why don't you take my son and brian burke's like or uh, or sorry dale hunter's like oh okay and i didn't know he was available and that's how he started playing the ohl that's how hockey works little things like that Vinny. hey cam if i gave you the option to buy a car you can either go to the dealership or you can buy it from your house from the crib oh my god andy bellman they make it so easy for you they'll come to you not to mention they'll have videos of of any car that you want, they'll, they'll go right through it. They'll show you the ins and outs of everything, make it completely simple for you. And uh, I tell you what, they're great people to work with. They've been in the game a long time, Andy. They're huge hockey fans. They do a lot of charity work in this city, and they make it comfortable for you to go buy a car at Bellman. 
Exactly. And we're dealing with a pandemic. Cam didn't know that, but everybody else knows we're dealing with a real pandemic. This is serious stuff. And so that's why they're making an adjustment to make life as easy for you. Because people out there still need transportation. People out there were still planning on buying cars. Doesn't mean that you have to put that on hold. The NHL season's on pause, but your car aspirations don't need to be. www.bellman.com. You can email them. You can text them. They've got so many different ways. And again, they will do a virtual uh, meeting with you where they'll walk around cars. They'll show you the exterior. They'll show you the interior. Answer any questions you may have about the engine or the performance. And great lease deals. You can buy a new car. Pre-owned deals as well. And again, if you're a current Bellman customer, listen up to this as well. Because they will come to you with a nice, clean loaner car, all sanitized. You don't have to worry about the the big germs because they took care of it. They cleaned it all up for you. They'll leave you with the loaner car, take your car back to the shop, service it up for you, and then deliver it back to you. That's what I call service, Cam Jansen. They make it too easy, Andy. Everybody's going to start doing this kind of stuff now. They're innovative. Uh, they're great people. Check them out. Bellman. Bellman.com. If you can't get there, they'll come to you. Again, Bellman, Buick, Cadillac, GMC, or right across the street, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram. Bellman Automotive Group. Proud sponsor and big-time supporter of what we're doing here on the Cam and Strick podcast. www.bellman.com. Well, you had a good time in St. Louis, though, man, didn't you? Like, even the brief stint, like, playing in your hometown, like, we had, a, we had a good time. It's fun in here, isn't it? Well, absolutely. I think something at the time of my career being, like, the beginning, it was probably a little bit harder than I, you know, because I went to Ottawa after, and I remember Brian Murray's, like, you know, it's a lot of pressure playing in Canada, yada, yada, yada. And then I played my first game in Ottawa. And I'm like, oh, that nothing compared to playing in your hometown. Is like, oh god, <laughs> you know, like it, when you're when you're just trying to make it, it's a little bit, a little bit more pressure. But looking back on it now, to have the opportunity to play for your hometown team at a young age, like when I did, it was, it's kind of a dream come true. I, not everybody, you know, growing up as a hockey fan, always wants to play for their hometown team. So the fact that I was able to do that, um, you know, I'll never forget it, and it was a blast. But I think kind of coming up as a NHL goalie was a little bit harder, you know, playing home games in front of, it's not just playing a home game when you're playing in front of all your family and friends and everybody. So a little more pressure probably as, as a young kid. Um, but I'm glad I, you know, probably just maybe that much, you know, stronger. You and Bergie, like you guys used to hang out all the time. Didn't you, like, <laughs> I mean, it was yeah. such a young group coming in. Oh my God. Time, and you guys have all had long careers. It's been pretty amazing. Yeah, I think it was that one summer it was uh, like Osh and Bergy and me, and they were all in St. Louis, so they were, we were pretty much together every single day in the summer. We were all young and, you know, immature, so it was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and to be honest, like, the Blues were pretty lenient back then, too, as an organization. Like, it wasn't like it is now. Or, and so it just was like it was we – had, we, had, we had a fun time, and um, – and it's just it's just weird how that all went down, man. It was cool to see a couple of St. Louis guys hanging out, and uh, you know, in their hometown. It all works out in the end, bitch. But man, I was, speaking of hometown guys, I mean, gotta get to this. I don't know if Andy wanted to wait to get to this or not, but I got We gotta fucking break this whole thing down. Of course, the series last year, um, you know, just a grind. And Andy and I were just talking about this before we had you on. As far as the Blues and what they did throughout that playoff, uh, the playoffs last year. With Winnipeg to you know San Jose to Boston, the series against Dallas was the more most in your face. Didn't take any of the shit. Uh, hit back. Probably were the more physical team. It was so damn entertaining in that whole process. But uh, how, how was that for you as a whole, man? That that whole series that probably aged you by twenty years. You know, and when you're in it, you don't really think too much of it. You're just focused on obviously the task at hand. Um, yeah, I mean it was it was a great series. Obviously, coming down to double overtime and in Game Seven, with you know going either way there, uh, you know unfortunately it didn't go our way, but obviously the Blues were able to win that and then go on to win the Stanley Cup. So I, you know, talking with a lot of the players, they all said that it was the toughest series they played, and uh, it was a good series. You know, it was one of those just back and forth. Every game was a tight game, uh, like except for the Game Six, and obviously you get to Game Seven and a couple, you know, wraparounds that don't go in. Oh, uh, you know, it's, you kind of cringe thinking about it, but it's just the way it goes sometimes. 
So, bitch, I want to take you back to game six then. When you get hit in the face by the by the puck from Pareko, like, did you – was it as bad as it looked or was it not? Because I remember you kind of talking about it. And I can't remember you said, hey, it wasn't maybe as bad as it looked. Or, like, take us through that play. Oh, I mean, obviously, if you know Pareko, he's probably got the second hardest shot in the league behind Weber. And I mean, he wound up that one. He got me right, right in the collarbone there. And it's just one of those things when it's like when a catcher gets a foul ball, right? It's, it's like a stinger. So it just, he ripped it and it's just a stinger and just, you know, drops you for a second. And then I, you know, I still don't understand why the ref didn't blow the whistle. It makes no sense, but they end up scoring yeah. on it. And it was just one of those things where, you know, when it hits you and you feel like you broke your, <laughs> broke your chest, but then, you know, 10 minutes later, you're fine. Like, you're fine. It's just like a catcher getting stinger and whatnot. So mm-hmm. it was one of those things. I think it blew it up a little bit bigger than it was. But, I, you know, anytime you get hit by one of those clappers in the collarbone, uh, it's never a good feeling. But, you know, obviously, leaves a little bit of a bruise there for a bit. But you're fine. You know, 10 minutes later, it just catches you there. And it feels like you broke your chest. But <laughs> you're just fine. Why didn't they call that down, bitch, So What was the reasoning behind that? I, I don't know. You know, the refs in the playoffs sometimes they get on you know. Well, what's the official? Well, Andy, what's the official rule on that? What was the? Re- I, I, I remember the whole play, but why? Why didn't they blow that down? I don't know. I don't know if, it, if they. If we, I'm trying to remember, bitch. Was it? Does Dallas need to have possession of the puck for the whistle? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I Steiner got that, it. That's right. Steiner well, got it right after. It this. actually was an unbelievable tip because Steiner got it and shot it like ten feet wide, and mm-hmm. Shortsy batted like tipped it out of the air into the empty net, but it was a pretty unbelievable tip. But at 99.9% of the time, they'll blow the whistle because you don't really want the guy, to, the goalie, to get hurt either, right? Right, right. If, if, you know, Steiner takes a slap shot at the back of my neck or something when I'm not looking. So, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the refs, they get all worked up in the playoffs and try to be heroes and whatnot, so. <laughs> well, yeah, they were, they, they were they weird. Had their their share. They had their yeah, share last exactly. year. Exactly. Lots of controversy going. But I mean, it's I mean, it's a, uh, those guys have the hardest job, you know, ref and playoff series. I mean, I, I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. And whatever. I mean, it wasn't the difference in that game, so it didn't really make a difference. You know, e- even though it didn't go the the way you wanted to go, but you gotta like, I think even the picture. And again, this is a somber moment for you, but God Almighty, you gotta appreciate you and Patty hugging. And I know you know what picture I'm talking about. And again, it's a different feel for you than this, Patty. But you know, you know some people say two St. Louis boys. We all know each other. You guys battle it out like warriors. And all of a sudden, there's a picture of you guys hugging with the St. Louis flag in the background. You know, again, you gotta like sit back and be like, that's fucking pretty cool, man. Like, from, from, I'm coming from fucking Kirkwood, playing as a Ford until you're eight years old, and all of a sudden, you're you know, you and Patty Maroon are hugging at center eye. I don't know. Although, you know, you wish it was the opposite, but damn, dude, you got to appreciate that, can't you? It's, yeah, it's a pretty wild, wild photo is with the, you know, the flag in the background. And I think it's a great, great picture for, you know, St. Louis youth hockey and kids, you know, yeah. growing up, hopefully aspiring to be there. But yeah, I think the photo is a lot better for Patty than it is me. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> exactly. I know. Sorry. I'm but come on. Hey, but you know what everybody said? You know what everybody said? No, I'm just you know, <laughs> bitch, bitch, you know what everybody said after the game? And like, listen, and this is honestly what they said, because you were, it was one of the best performances we've seen by both. Oh my God. Right? In that game. Like you were by far the best player on the ice for both teams. And a lot of people were saying, man, if it was ever going to go down, this was a perfect way for it to go down. The game's in St. Louis, obviously Blues fans, they want the Blues to win, but at the same time, you played unbelievable in the game, and it was one of the more entertaining games in the history of the organization. So, like, people didn't – listen, if you would have won, right, people here obviously would be like, ah, oh, screw Bish, whatever they won. <laughs> and, and, and the Dallas Hurts, they Not loved me. you after the game, and they loved you after the game, and yes. they would have loved to win, but it was kind of the best-case scenario a little bit, isn't it, even you know, with you losing? Uh, not not best case that you lost, but best-case scenario with you losing, the fact that you played so well. It was probably best-case scenario for the Blues fans, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fuck that. You walked out of there with your head up high, dude. You fucking no, dumb. No, I'm not dude, I'm You sure, gave us sure. all heart attacks, man. You're fucking <laughs> saving everything. Get out of here, dude. <laughs> but I know you, you were in the locker room. I, I, at least you knew. Like, you didn't look like – you weren't, like, hanging your head, man. You knew that you gave it everything you had. And I'll never forget, like, where we were in our, in our suite for the games, our broadcasters. Your parents were right next to us, like your family was. Like your family suite was right next. 
to to where we were watching the game. And I can't imagine what they went through, man. In a game seven, in overtime, double overtime, watching your kid play goalie, man, that has got to be one of the most stressful things you can ever go through. But yeah, I mean, now that I have a son, I, I don't think I'll ever let him be a goalie. That's for sure. <laughs> no, no. How did they handle that though? Having the the series here in St. Louis, obviously you've been in the NHL for a long time, but is that odd for a player's family being in the town where their kid is playing against that team, and yeah. you know, in the playoffs? What's that like? Yeah, I think so. I mean. Obviously, my parents grew up in St. Louis, too, so lifelong Blues fans and whatnot. And they were just as excited to see the Blues win the Stanley Cup as anybody else. But I think it makes it a little bit different when they beat your, your son and whatnot. So my poor parents, they probably aged a few years, you know, or probably a lot of years watching me play hockey over the, all over the, you know, over the years. But uh, they've been great supporters of mine, you know, since day one, so... You know, I've never played a bad game in their eyes, so it's always always nice getting out of the rink and talking to them. But, yeah, I mean, God bless them. They're always there for me through the good and the bad. And uh, definitely lost some fingernails, I'm sure, through the years, biting them off. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're telling me your dad's never seen a bad game by you? Come on. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm just, I'm, <laughs> fuck you, kids, dude. You know, it's like my dad has it. Yeah, right. That's staring no, at us from fucking yep. Chicago. Yeah, I never, he never yells at me, so he never, <laughs> never tries to give me advice. So uh, he's always, ever since day one, you know, I could, I, be honest, man, he's never really? sat there and yelled at me after a game or anything like that. He's always been supportive, and you know, he never played the game, but he's always, you know, kind of trusted the guys like Perry Turnbull around him. And but no, they, both my parents have always got the car, and they've always been positive. So I'm very, you know lucky that that was the case from some of the stories i've heard <laughs> oh my god i know oh my god yeah. i love that i would imagine the stories you hear man especially being in the nhl like just i not every player went through that, the same experience man i'm sure some of them had just crazy upbringings you know with their parents being as crazy into it as we see some of these parents but why has it been such a good fit for you in dallas how's that group there uh, it's been great um it's a good good team here obviously a lot of good players um and, it, you know, the systems we play, we brought in Rick Bonus, who I was with in Tampa for all those years there. And, you know, bringing him in obviously helped, you know, shore up the defense. And obviously, we had Hitch the first year, who was, you know, a great defensive coach as well. So we've had some, you know, good coaching and a lot of players that just buy in. You know, we've had Roman here in the last couple of years. It's been awesome. And just a really good group. And, you know, we're, we're really close. And, you know, hopefully we can start the season again. And, I, you know, I think we got a really good team. I, I think the Central's probably the strongest division. So it's going to be tough for any team in the Central to get out because we're going to all going to be battling each other. And, you know, I think, you know, as the Stars, I think if we can win that game seven last year, you know, I think we just have as good as a chance as St. Louis is going on. So uh, I think we're not kind of right in our prime now. Obviously, we've got to fight with all the other teams in the Central, but uh, hopefully we can get some type of playoff format going here to end the year. I know, man. Like, we're all craving it, dude. Like, I'm talking about fucking tornadoes every day on my radio show, bitch. Like, it's fucking embarrassing. I'm also, like, breaking <laughs> down, like, the animals in my backyard and shit. Like, a play-by-play. That's the sporting. That's what I'm watching. Like, it's fucking horrible. Who do you, who, who your, who your buddies on that team, by the way? Are you, you hanging out with Ben? Like, say again, like, who do you, who do you hang with on that team? Yeah, well, you know, Jamie, Ben, actually, when I came down here, after I signed, I bought a house, and I didn't really know until two months later that Jamie Ben was my neighbor. Like out of all the places I could have bought a house, and <laughs> I do not know that. Next, right next I do door. not know that, dude. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Like I literally bought the house. I went down for a weekend, and we looked at you know twenty something houses. Of course, the last house we looked at, we we ended up buying that one. And then I went home, and then it wasn't until honestly like a month or two later, you know, after we closed and all that stuff, somebody was like, you know, Jamie lives across the street there. I was like, what? They're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're captain. So he's been my You're neighbor. captain. <laughs> and he uh he lives down here i mean i've been down here most of the summer the last couple summers too just having kids and stuff down here so he's down here all the time so we work out together all the time and you know sagan he's down here now and all the guys you know we're a tight group so uh we kind of have a pretty you know international team so us north americans are obviously really close and you know, we have like four Finns, three or four russians a couple czechs a couple swedes so we got them all, but uh, it's it's a good group. 
is St. Louis your guys' biggest rival? And is there like is there serious hatred for St. Louis inside that dressing room? Is it is it what it appears to be on the outside? You know, I think anytime you play, just in my experience throughout the years, you know, in you know Tampa playing all the playoff series, any team you play in the playoffs ends up becoming a rival the next year. You know, obviously Nashville we played them, and I think they hate us, and you know we played St. Louis, and I think there's an equal hatred between those two as well. So. I think anytime you play a team, you know, six, seven times in a row in a playoff series, you learn to hate them pretty quick. And that's kind of been the case, I'd say, you know, every team I've ever played on. So anytime you can get some type of, you know, playoff rival, it definitely fuels it as far as moving forward to the next year. So, Bish, listen, this year has been kind of crazy for you guys. Like, I've known Jim Montgomery for a long time. Obviously, he's a good coach, had his own personal issues. But as a team, you guys got past that so quickly was how long did it take for the shock to pass over you know after finding out that he was no longer your coach and you guys were moving in a different direction with rick bonus it was wild i mean nobody had any idea anything was going on and then we just showed up we had a game that night we showed up in the morning and all of all of the brass was in the locker room and everybody had suits and ties on Guys are like, did you hear? And I'm like, no, like, what's going on? They're like, Monty got fired. And so it just happened that quick. And then Bones was the coach, and we had a game that night. So, I mean, it's not like we had any time to sit there and think about it or dwell on it. Uh, it was just straight into the, the next game. And you know how the season is. It's a game every other night. So we kind of got on a roll when Bones took over. I think we won six or seven in a row. I forget. I could be wrong. But you know, just kind of didn't miss a beat. We have an old team, you know, veteran team. So that type of stuff doesn't really bother us. And we were able to just kind of keep going forward. And obviously a couple of weeks later, you can almost kind of forget about it. Have you ever seen them since? No, I haven't seen them. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't really know exactly what he's, what he's up to. Obviously it's a little personal on his side and yeah. I don't know exactly. Maybe what, you, you know. talked to the team or something. I don't know if you like had talked to the team well, or something. He sent some texts, obviously, after it happened. Okay. To, you know, doing his thing. And then, you know, I think he ended up going to take care of himself. And yeah, uh, now we're all in quarantine. So <laughs> that was good. Yeah, I know. But... <laughs> not hanging out with anybody now. <laughs> so you've had a bunch of different coaches there, obviously, since you got to Dallas, so starting with Hitch. Hey, you know, before you go, Bish, you told me uh, – before you even showed up to Dallas, I think, and it was, I don't know if you had, if you had been, you know, if you had signed there yet or not, but, um, but you said Andre Vasilevsky is the best goalie in the league. I think if he's not now, he will be very, very soon. Like, what do you, you like that kid, don't you? And what, what made you think so quickly before he was even established that he was going to turn out to be as good as he is? Yeah, I mean, he's like a little brother to me when he came up, uh, you know, he was, He's just such a good kid, you know, he was just a sponge, wanted to learn anything, like one of the hardest workers I've ever seen. And I, when, the first time you see the guy play, I mean, he's he's a big, strong guy that plays, you know, just the most flexible human I've ever seen and the most explosive human I've ever seen and one of the hardest workers. So <laughs> when you put yes. all that stuff together, um, you know, I don't even know how to explain it. He's, you know, he's just like Gumby he kind of plays that quickie as far as being the splits, no matter where he is, but he's also got the size and explosiveness. Um, and he's done a good job over the years. He's kind of timing it down. I think you know, sometimes he tries to get too, too acrobatic and try to make the pretty saves instead of trying to keep it simple. But, you know, he, he really works at his craft and he really, you know, he, he wants to be the very best and you can kind of see that in him. And I think he's got an opportunity to do that. Um, obviously it's a learning curve throughout, you know, the years, every year you the goal, you, you learn a little more. So I think he'll, he'll just get better, but yeah, he definitely has the potential to go down as one of the best, I think. Hey, I get one, one more question. This is kind of a nerdy question. I'm, I'm surprised Andy hasn't asked one, this one yet, but I'm going <laughs> to steal his shit. If, if you, if you had a guy on that, on that right side, I'm sorry, left side on the power play, either Sagan or Stammer. Who do you think you have a better chance of uh, saving it on a on a one T situation? That's a good question, Andy. That's an Andy Strickland well, question, right there. Go ahead, yeah. please. <laughs> well, you're trying to put me on. I'm putting you in a spot, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You got That's a question. That's a question I'd ask you on the radio in the summertime, bitch. You know that? Okay. Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> hey, come on. Who's got? Like, is there a difference between them? They're both sick. I know that, but I mean, I don't know. Yeah, there, there is a there is a difference. I think Stammer obviously has a has a bigger one timer, but I think Segi's got kind of better for like a wrister, you know, as far as coming in and picking spots. Yeah, Stammer obviously can hit the one timer better than you know probably second best in the league. He, him and Ovi, the guy's been doing it for years. And you know Segi's, I mean, comparing apples and oranges, you know, they're both one of the best in the game at it. So they both have their things. I mean, that's why they're obviously both one of the best players in the, in the league. So yeah, it's hard to pick. I think Stammer obviously has been, has that one timer down, you know, pretty, pretty good. And, you know, say you can kind of score from all over the place. So they both have it. I, I would take either. <laughs> Not or you wouldn't person. take either. You wouldn't want to go against either. Again. But you know, listen, I did like a, we do like these film room type stuff with, with blues players. I did something with Robert Bortuzzo about blocking shots and we had, you know, three right-hand shots and you know, Ovechkin, Stamkos, and oh, Patrick yeah. Line and just turn it into, you know, where you want to be or whatever, because all these guys, you know, like the, the one timer on the power play. But Ovechkin, there's like, everybody knows it's coming. He's standing there, but no one can seem to stop it. Like, why is that? What makes this guy so different than everybody else outside of just being able to shoot the puck hard, man? Like, how come he can continue to do it for as long as he's been doing it? Well, the thing about Ovi is that Ovi is basically a knuckleball every time it's coming at you. He never, it never has the same, same path. You know, you know how they do that stuff with the yeah. pitchers. If they could follow that puck, you know, because he's got that yeah. huge curve. So I don't, I can't tell you how many times, you know, you think you're, it's coming kind of into your glove, and then next, thing you know, it's going through your arm or your body, because his puck has so much coming. Sometimes they dip, sometimes they rise, sometimes they curve. So always is always, you know, knuckling. But the puck isn't knuckling, but it's always moving. Where most guys kind of have a straight path from when it goes off their stick and into the net, it's almost more of a straight line. So you can make the save where Obi's is always dipping and diving and, you know, doing its own thing. That's what makes Obi so hard to stop and why he scored so many goals. And I think Line, you know, he's got, I mean, when he hits that thing too, that thing is an absolute missile, you know, one of the hardest pucks I've. You know, it's not like heavy one like Branko and Weber, but Lainez comes off, you know, so hard. And if he hits his spot, it's almost impossible to save too because his is so hard off the stick. And I think you look at Stammers. I think Stammers one of the most accurate guys as far as, you know, you watch him take one-timers of practice and he hits the, you know, hits the spot nine out of ten times where, you know, you see other guys do it. They'll hit the post or the crossbar, you know, seven or eight times, but the camera has it right in a spot every time. So everybody kind of has their own little thing, you know, you learn throughout the years. But and even like, you know, said he can pick it off so clean, you know, it comes off a stick so quick too. So, I mean, everybody has their own little thing and they're all, you know, one of the best at it, so. Yeah, you're right, Bish. I do have my own thing, especially with these <laughs> MX. I'm fucking picking corners like it's going out south, baby. Oh and I will God. say this. They need your help. The alumni goaltending situation is not up to par. So I know you got a long <laughs> you got, I know you got a long we got a long ways away uh before you retire, but damn it, we already uh we're gonna hey, you, 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 you think you'll live in St. Louis, Bish? You think you'll live in St. Louis when you retire or you don't know? Yeah, no, we're all living in St. Louis. That's yeah. That's sure. Yeah, there yeah. Yeah, yeah, Andy, what's up? You're playing gray now, Andy. You're not gonna <laughs> <first shit. laughs> I don't I think it. Bish. I don't think Bish will be putting the goalie pads. That this is when he's the fuck he's not. Forward. Yes, he is putting the goalie pads on. <laughs> you better. Oh man! Oh my God! We, we should have done, done, done a hockey interview. You know, Cam started uh, off and got right into tornadoes and stuff. But just I don't, now you're like turning into an analyst. You're unbelievable breaking this stuff down. So holy <laughs> <laughs> shit. We love it, Bish, man. Appreciate you coming on, dude. And uh, we're, we, you know, we're we're excited about this hockey season. You've you've just you've been you've been having a great fucking year. You've had a great uh, overall career, man. And uh, we love watching you play, dude. All right, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. And thanks, stay Bish. Safe. You too, man. Wash your hands, Cam. I do, man. I fucking take showers every two seconds. <laughs> well, let me write that down. Wash your hands, Cam. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> Even when there is no corona, he's telling you. <laughs> settle down. Settle down. <laughs> All right, boys. We'll see you, Bish. Thanks a lot, buddy. See you, Bish. All right, that was Ben Bishop. We appreciate him jumping on. Always good to talk with Big Ben. 
And again, you hope he uh, finds a way to crack through and win a Stanley Cup. He will. Before his career is done. No doubt about he that. Will, man. Hey, that interview was brought to you by our friends over at the Bellman Automotive Team. God, I love them. www.bellman.com. Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram Buick GMC Cadillac. They're right across the street from each other. Get yourself hooked up. Let them bring a car to you. Fully sanitized. Yeah. No corona on no, the cars. No. And uh, they'll take care of you. So check them out. www.bellman.com. Of course, our friends at cope24.com. www.cope24.com. And then right here, our boy Conrad Ooh, and yeah. Lamb. Listen, I want to give a shout out to the Sandstone family yes, real please. quick. Can you please? Because Anthony Sr., yep. um, he had eight kids, man, including uh, Jim Sansone whose sons, uh, Jim Jr. I want you to name all Conrad them. Conrad and them. Lamb, Lan. They all, they all, they all work here. Jimmy, Jimmy. They all, own, Jimmy. they all own the normal brand, man. It's, it's, it's owned by the Sansone family. Of course, Tony Sansone is a, is a good friend of love ours, man. Him. We love Tony. Special, special people, man. And uh, so we're, our thoughts are with the Sansone Dude, family. this family does so much for this damn town mm -hmm. and the blues and yes. youth hockey. I remember working with them back in the day doing yeah. charity events. They raise money for charity. Great people, and they got unbelievable clothing. So this is a tough room. time. It's a tough dude. time. Tough man. time. Because this Bad guy started family. the entire Sansone compound. They are a fucking awesome We're trying family. to get adopted. We're trying to change our names. Can I look like you guys? They're Andy, all beautiful. Andy Sansone. I know. Can I be a Sansone and have beautiful f bl black hair? They all look like fucking models. They are per the perfect family, and we love them to death. Yes. They work their asses off. Jim and Kathy, we're thinking about you guys. We're thinking about you guys. Yes. We love you to death, man. Yes. We do. And thanks for letting us do it here no at the normal brand. Social distance Beautiful style, family. six feet apart. Beautiful family. What do you think of Bish? Bish is an awesome cat. Speaking of beautiful family, there's another one They've right there. They've been through a lot of shit. They've been through by some way, shit. In Dallas. I know. Oh Tornadoes God. and shit. Tornadoes. Fuck Jim man. Montgomery. Jim Montgomery, like, motherfuck. He answered that great, man. Mm -hmm. Fucking Benny Bishop. Good kid. Good family. Bishop's post down in Chesterfield. Love yeah, them all. Great we fucking take care of the people here, man. Oh, it yeah. is. We'll pump their tires up. Yeah. We love them. Thank you, Benny Bishop. Appreciate and it. And Ben Bishop, he's never said no. He always comes on with you. He's a yes in the guy. In the summer, he comes in town, man. He'll come to a yeah. radio show with you, yeah. whatever. And uh, Happy, obviously, we've done television smiling. with him. This guy's, this guy's the best. The fucking man. And he's a damn good hockey player, too. So hope you enjoyed that. Ben Bishop, man. We just keep cranking them out. we got more guests coming your way, big too. Big boys. we got big boys. we got some big ones coming up next week. <laughs> we got big, big ones That's coming up do. next week. That's what we do, So baby. check it out. Um, what's our Twitter account? At Cam and Strick Pod. Mm -hmm. That's our Instagram account as well. You can always follow Cam Jansen. At Cam Cam Jansen twenty five. I'll fucking say it. <laughs> How was, do you not fucking know? What was your know? number? Fifty five. It's twenty five in Jersey. Damn, whatever. If you could pick which number, which number would you pick? Baby. Fifty five, baby. Really? That's a linebacker number. What's up? What's up, Colm Preco? That's my number, Colm Preco. You oh, took it from me. Shit. I don't even fucking like you now because of it. He's got beautiful hair. Not by like He's Colm a Preco. beautiful human being. We're gonna get I him love on. him. We're gonna get him on. He fucked me over on the number situation, <laughs> but it is what it is. <laughs> He's better than you. He's way better than me. That, number could, be, that number could be hanging from the rafters one day. It's going to be a little side note, an asterisk. It says Jansen, and then Pareko will be the big one, but I'll have a little asterisk on the side that says Who Jansen. else has worn 55? Oh, a oh, fucking Christian Backman. Oh, Fuck he his did. stupid ass. I, I, I he was, was a soft as shit. I, I love Christian Backman. He was soft. He used to come out to the team I was coaching. Okay, and, good guy, and, though. Oh, he would like okay, good run practices okay. and stuff. Okay, you could be soft and be a good guy one, at the I think same one time. of the Babbages, maybe, wore 55. You know anybody else? I, like, I don't care about the 80s. It's what, what's what have you done for me lately? Christian Backman was late two thousands. That's how I think about it. first round pick too. Oh no shit! Yeah, he was. Oh, go. How'd that go? How'd that turn out? Great dude. <laughs> all right, Ben Bishop. Hope you enjoyed this one. Follow us on all our social media platforms and be sure to subscribe. Yeah. To the Cam and Strick podcast. Until next time, stay healthy, everybody.